Romans chapter 5, verse 17. I want to read that. And this is uh, session 13 in our class, in, Indwelling Life. And it's, been, it's a life-changing, not because I'm teaching, it's just because the Word of God is life-changing. But it's life-changing truth for us. Very life-changing. And this is session 13, Living from Victory. Very, very important, very important that we live from victory and not for victory. Because when you live for victory, you are going to burn out, you are going to strive, and you are going to try to do a bunch of things for God that God's not looking for, and you're going to waste a bunch of time in your life. But Romans 5.17 is an amazing passage of Scripture, and I want to encourage you just to spend some time meditating on that this verse of Scripture Paul in, in Romans chapter 5 is, contra, is, is talking about imputation and what that means. That might be a big word to you, but we'll get into it to explain what it means. But Paul's writing in Romans 5.17 and he says, For if by the transgression of the one, talking about Adam, death reigned through the one, much more, much more, those who receive the abundance of grace, and we're going to have a whole session on grace, very vital, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. This is going to be our, our, our theme or our focus today in this message. The gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Now, I believe there is a translation. I believe there's a better translation here in this one, last, this one phrase where it says, if you receive the gift of righteousness, you will reign in life. And some people take that to mean like, okay, you're going to be successful in what you do, or you're going to be very successful as a business person. You're going to be successful as a parent. You're going to be successful in whatever God's called you to do, even as a minister or whatever it is, that you're going to reign in life. I don't believe that's actually the right interpretation. I believe a better interpretation, this word in could be translated in, by, or with, in fact, the, the King James Version translates in 1,900 times, by 163 times, and with 140 times. I believe a better translation is that what Paul is saying, if you receive the gift of righteousness, you will reign by divine life. You will reign by divine life. That word reign means you will reign as a king. You are called to live in victory. You are called to live in victory in your life. Now, but that, that life is not your life. It's the Zoe life of Jesus Christ who is life inside of you. It's the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who is life in you is the life you are meant to live by. Not your own life, but his life, his Zoe life. And so Paul's saying that if you receive the gift of righteousness, you will reign by Zoe life. You will live in victory. But here's the, the real emphasis of this message is if you're still trying to live for victory instead of from victory... That means you're still trying to live by what you do, by your obedience. Uh, obedience is very important, but by your obedience, your acceptance, you're striving for God to like you instead of living from that place where God already does love you and like you and accepts you and approve of you in Jesus Christ. There is a world of difference between living for victory and living from victory. Very important because if you want to live in victory... You must live from victory. Amen. I'm glad everyone's excited about that. There was a story uh, in last year's Super Bowl 2022 when Cooper Cup and the Los Angeles Rams defeated the Bengals 23 to 20. And Cooper Cup won the MVP. He's a wide receiver of the Los Angeles Rams. And Afterwards, the story came out that Cooper Cup, after in 2019, when the Patriots defeated the Rams in the Super Bowl, Cooper Cup, who is a Christian, had this vision where he real, the Lord showed him, you're, you're going to come back to the Super Bowl with the Los Angeles Rams, and you are going to walk off the field as the MVP. That was in 2019. 
a wise guy, a wise man, he didn't tell anyone else except his wife because he's like, okay, I'm not sure if this is God or not. I don't want to look like I'm crazy. So he didn't tell anyone else except his wife. Now, this is, this is what he said. I'm going to read what he said. He said, I don't know what it was. It was this vision from God that revealed to me we were going to come back and we were going to somehow be part of the Super Bowl. I was going to, I was going to, we were going to win it. I was somehow going to walk off the field as the MVP. And he said this, this was already written. I just got to play free, knowing that I got to play from victory and not for victory. I got to play in a place where I was validated, not from anything that happened on the field, but because of my worth in God, in my Father. See, Cooper Cup played. Now, that doesn't mean he just didn't practice and sat on the couch and watched, you know, movies all day and said, well, God already said that I'm going to win this thing. Therefore, I'm just going to, you know, sit back and coast through this. No, he practiced hard and he worked hard, but he worked from a place of victory instead of, a, instead of striving for victory. And so what Paul is saying in Romans 5, 17 is that you are to live from victory, from the victory that Jesus Christ purchased for you in the finished work of the cross. You are to live from victory and not for victory. Just like Cooper Cup, you are to live from the finished work of the cross. You are to live from this position in Jesus Christ where God sees you in Christ already righteous, already crucified, already resurrected, already ascended, already enthroned. That doesn't mean he doesn't want that to be worked out in experience. He does. He wants to align your legal, your living condition, your actual condition with your legal position. But living from this legal position is vital to living from victory and living in victory. See, if you try to live for victory, it is the quickest way to defeat. What happens is you begin to take your focus off of Jesus Christ and put it onto yourself. How well am I measuring up? How well am I performing? How well am I obeying? How well am I doing? Instead of living from the victory Jesus won for you on the cross. And you know, and, we've, and if you've been a believer for more than a year or two years, you know every one of us have tried to do that, haven't we? We've all tried to live for God and try to do things that we think God wants. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying to live in disobedience. I'm not saying... I'm definitely not preaching taking grace to a biblical extreme to give you a license to sin. I'm not saying any of that. O obedience is vital. We're going to talk about obedience. But if you don't live from this place of victory, you are going to burn out because the focus is going to shift away from Jesus unto yourself and how well you do. And so this brings me to the fourth law. Uh, you know, we've been going through for the last, this is the fourth week, the four law, four, uh, ten laws of the Spirit-led life. This is the fourth law of the Spirit-led life, is to live in victory, you must live from victory. The, victory. the victory Christ won for you through his crucifixion and his resurrection. Now, I just want you to think about this for a second. Is you're called to reign like a king in life. By divine life, you're called to reign as a king. But that means usually, okay, there are some things I need to overcome. Or there's, you know, just think about it. Are there some things you need to overcome in your life? I'm sure, you know, unless you're already an overcomer, I mean, fully ready for the Lord. If you are, I'd love to meet you because none of us are yet. But just think about this. What area is it in your life you struggle with? Is it pride? Is it anger? Is it lust? Is it rejection? Is it bitterness? Anxiety, depression? insecurity, rejection. I mean, you could list a million different things and you're like, yes to all those, I understand. You know, it might be yes for all of those for you, but God has called you to reign in life over all of these things. God has called you to reign by the divine life of Jesus Christ in you, not you reigning in your own strength and power, but him living in you and him reigning in you and through you. See, you're called to overcome by divine life, the life of Jesus Christ in you, the life of Jesus Christ that is, that is in your human spirit joined to the Holy Spirit. As that life of God is transmitted to your human spirit, it empowers you to overcome whatever it is you're struggling with. 
You're called to reign in life. But here's what, it, here's what we're, the, the, the very thing this hinges on. This hinges upon the gift of righteousness. And it hinges on you receiving the abundance of grace. We're going to focus on the gift of righteousness, but let me just talk about this. Your legal position in Christ. That might sound like, you know, a lot of times when you talk about legal stuff, people zone out and get bored. But it's very, very important to the gospel that you understand the way God sees you in Christ. See, the Lord said in John 14, 20, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me. So I just want you to take, just, just to receive this for a second. You, if you're born again, you are in Christ by God's doing. You are in Christ by God's doing. Not only are you in Christ, but Christ is in you. I in you. We've been talking a lot about Christ in you. That's your living condition. That's the actual condition of your inward man, your inward person. It is Christ in you. But there's also this, this dynamic of you in Christ. And both are vital to living by his life. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that by his doing you are in Christ. I love that. By his doing, this is something you cannot do. But by the Spirit of God, when you were born again, by the Spirit of God, by his doing, you are in Christ. It's something you cannot do in your own strength. You cannot perform enough, do enough. You can't... What, it's something entirely that the Spirit of God has done in you when you were born again. You are in Jesus Christ, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And I also love the fact that when you were born again, the Spirit of God, He baptized you into the body of Jesus Christ into the very body of Jesus Christ so that now you are in him. And therefore, when God sees you, he sees you in Christ. And he reckons that whatever is true of Christ is also true of you. Now again, God doesn't want to just leave you in your legal position. He wants to align your living condition with your legal position. We'll have a session about that later. Because some people get stuck in this and they've been Christians for 30 years and they say, well, I'm the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And I'm saying, well, why do you still have a lust problem? Why do you still have an anger problem? Why do you still have a pride problem? God wants to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. But to do that, he wants to align our living condition by Christ in us and him living instead of you. And he wants to align that to who, he see, who, who we are in Christ and how God sees us. God sees you righteous in Christ. God sees you justified in Christ. God sees you crucified with Christ. He sees you resurrected, ascended, enthroned. He sees you as one who is more than a conqueror. You are dead to sin, dead to self, dead to the law in Jesus Christ. The problem is we don't believe this. This is the foundation to living in victory is to live from this position of the way God sees you. This is the gospel. This is Romans 4 through 7. The way God sees you in Christ. He is your new covenant representative. You are in Christ by God's doing. He has baptized you into his body. So now when God looks at you, he sees he sees Christ, he sees you in Christ, and he imputes or he, reck he reckons whatever is true of Christ to be true of you. What an incredibly glorious truth this is, the gospel. Now back to Romans 5.17, Paul had this idea that if you want to reign in life by divine life, if you want to reign by divine life, if you want to reign by Zoe life, by Christ in you, then it's the gift of righteousness that is so vital. 
It's imputed righteousness. Now, that's a legal term that a lot of times Christians zone out on and like, what does that even mean? But Paul devoted Romans chapter 4 through 7 talking about the concept of imputation and what is the heart of the gospel. And so if you don't understand what imputation means, then you're going to not really understand the gospel. I'm just going to just tell you real quick, and we'll go into it in a second deeper, but Jesus Christ as a man, stemming from his divine nature, the God-man, when he obeyed the law perfectly when he, in his flesh, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God imputes to you into your account. So God looks at you and he says, the obedience of my son, the perfect obedience of my son to the law of Moses has now been imputed to you. So I reckon you to be obedient just like Jesus and righteous just like Jesus. This means you are declared righteous not by what you do, but by what Jesus Christ has done. Again, part of me is like, I, you know, I, I hate to even say this because some people could take it the wrong way and say there's a license for sin. Absolutely not. Paul said, am I saying that we should live in sin so that grace may increase? God forbid. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, if you want to get your right, if you want to be made ready for Jesus Christ as a worthy bride, if you want to be obedient like God is calling us to be obedient, you've got to start from the right foundation. You've got to make yourself ready from righteousness, not for righteousness. You've got to make yourself from, ready from this position where God sees you in Christ. See, when Jesus was on the cross, your sins were imputed to him. He was perfectly righteous, though God dealt with him as if he was a sinner, though he never was. Because your sins, my sins, the sins of the entire world were imputed to Jesus Christ. So God reckoned him a sinner and God poured out his wrath and his condemnation and his judgment upon Jesus Christ on the cross so that you and I could be the righteousness of God in him. That's imputation. God imputes it onto Christ, and God judges it in Christ, and God imputes the righteousness of Christ to you, so God sees you as righteous in Jesus Christ. So what does this mean? This word means to attribute, impute. So I, I, I can, a lot of times, Christians don't understand this. They get impart and impute confused, and they're very different. Impart means when, when you're born again, the spirit of Jesus Christ imparted to you into your human spirit and made your human spirit actually righteous and holy and Christ-like. We talked about that in one of the earlier sessions. That is the impartation of righteousness to actually make you righteous in your spirit. Imputation is to reckon you as if you're righteous even though you're not. But God deals with you as if you are. Does that make sense? There's a difference between impute and impart. And you must understand both of them or you're going to be confused. You're not going to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ or how to live by divine life if you don't understand impute and impart. You must understand both. Impute means to attribute or ascribe to a person, to assign as a characteristic, to credit to one's account, to reckon something as belonging to another. See, this is a, in, in reality, this is a legal term. You think about it like this is if you are a parent and your kids are driving or about to drive soon, and I'm saying this like going, this is like putting the fear of God in me because Anna's getting to that age where she'll be driving soon, you know that your child is on your insurance. And so therefore, if they get a speeding ticket and do the dumb things that teenagers do, and you know they get a speeding ticket, then that is going to be imputed onto your, your insurance even though you didn't commit the act. And what's going to happen is your insurance is going to go up. See, what happened is you, didn't, you weren't the one who violated the speed limit. Your, your child was. But because of the relationship of the child to the parent, 
that offense is imputed to you and your insurance goes up, even you though you did nothing wrong. See, in Jesus Christ, you are a sinner, but in Jesus Christ, you are declared righteous because what Christ did on the cross and the way he lived in perfect obedience to the law of Moses... That obedience was now imputed to you, so you're reckoned to be righteous because of your relationship to him. That's good news. Another example is you could take it, you could take this idea of impute into a business situation where, let's say there's a business with four partners, but one of the partners has a ton of knowledge about something that happened, and the other three partners don't know anything about what happened. Well, that knowledge that that one partner has is imputed to the other three partners, even though they don't have that knowledge, in a court of law, so that a judge reckons the other three partners as having that knowledge, even though they don't, because they're in that relationship with the one who does. Does that make sense? So that knowledge is imparted to the other partners, even though they don't have it themselves, because of the relationship they're in. So the judge says, you are not going to get out uh, free of this and claim innocence because I am imputing the knowledge of this business partner to you because you're in that business with them in that relationship with them. So those are just modern day examples, but you can look at th throughout scripture, God always from Genesis to Revelation works on this concept of imputation. Adam's sin w was imputed to all of us so that we are reckoned sinners. You can read that in Romans chapter 5. You can also look at the time when Abraham, or when, yeah, when Abraham, he paid tithes to Melchizedek. And then years later in Hebrews, or when, when the writer of Hebrews wrote, he says, Levi actually paid tithes to Melchizedek in Abraham because Abraham's actions of pay, paying tithes to Melchizedek was imputed to Levi, even though he didn't pay those tithes. You can look at it too, uh, Achan, when Achan stole the treasure in Jericho. That, that treasure, all the Israelites didn't steal that treasure. Achan stole that treasure. Yet God said, Israel has sinned. It wasn't Israel. It was one person that sinned. And God imputed the sin of Achan to Israel and said, you must get this sin out of the camp. And the, of course, the ultimate example of imputation is when Jesus Christ was on the cross and all of the sin of the world was imputed to him from the garden all the way to the end of the age. The sin of the cross was imputed to Jesus Christ. who he, he was reckoned to be a sinner even though he was perfectly innocent before God as the innocent lamb. And, and the wrath and the condemnation we deserve, he took and he bore that punishment on the cross for you and for me. So that therefore we could be reckoned righteous in him. So imputation, wouldn't you say, is important. In fact, in Romans chapter uh, 4 through 7, I, or I, I, actually I call Romans chapter 4 the imputation chapter. Because I think, I think Paul uses impute, the word impute 11 times in Romans chapter 4 alone. And Romans chapter 4 is really the heart of the gospel. And so let's look at Romans chapter 4 verse 2. Paul was saying that if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is, cre is not credited as a favor, but as what is due but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Now in this passage, Paul was quoting Genesis 15, 6. Where, it, where, where, where in this passage, it's, um, Paul used the word, this Hebrew word that means to impute, to reckon, to account, to consider. It's, it's really this what we've been talking about. And in, the, in, the, in Romans 4, 3, Paul uses a Greek word that means basically the same thing. It means to reckon, whether by calculation or imputation. See, here, here's another example to help you understand this concept. Is let's say that, and this is a fantasy world, but let's say that dad has like a million dollars in his bank account. And I have like a hundred in my bank account. And if I don't pay my mortgage, I am going to go into foreclosure. 
Well, dad, out of his million dollars, maybe I'm prophesying to you something. So out of his million dollars, dad pays my mortgage. The mortgage company is reckoned to have been paid by me in the eyes of the mortgage company, even though I did not pay it. My dad did. See, there's, see when, you, when you break down this word for imputation, there's both a legal side to it, impute, or a financial component to it to reckon or to uh, credit to one's account. So that's what Jesus has done for us. See, Paul even said that if, if you are an employer, if you're, an, if you're employed at a business, you work, and therefore, because you work, you are obligated to be paid by your employer. But he's saying to you, the, the gospel is not like that. The gospel is a free gift. The gift of imputed righteousness is a free gift. In fact, if you try to work to receive it, it'll disqualify you from receiving it because it must be received, not achieved. It must be received by faith, not achieved by you working. See, the, the, the gift of righteousness is unmerited, is undeserved, is God imputing to you and counting you and reckoning you righteous even though you are unrighteous. That's the beauty of the gospel. Thank God for that. <laughs> now again, there's a whole movement in the church called hyper grace, which takes the grace of God to an unbiblical extreme and says, well, because of the gift of righteousness and the gift of imputed righteousness, I can live however I want and God still sees me righteous. That is absolutely terrible error because the gift of imputed righteousness and sanctification are vastly different. When God imputes righteousness to you, it doesn't mean you are actually made righteous. All right? It's you are reckoned righteous. Does that make sense? See, you are not transformed and conformed into the image of Jesus Christ instantly when you are born again. This gift of righteousness does not transform you, but it is the basis of all transformation. Does that make sense? Because when God imputes righteousness to you, it does not transform you. However, when you get a revelation that you have been declared righteous apart from your obedience... That begins a, a, that's a catalyst for you being transformed by the gift of righteousness. Sanctification is how you are made actually righteous. Justification or imputed righteousness is how you are reckoned or positioned to be righteous. But they're vastly different. God's aim, God's goal, God's eternal purpose is to conform you and me into the image of his son. Imputed righteousness cannot do that. Imputed righteousness, though, is the foundation for that to happen. See, we've got a whole movement called hyper grace that says God sees you as righteous, and they're absolutely living however they want, saying God sees me as righteous. It doesn't matter how I live. Well, read Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. I think that contradicts that very much so. Because Jesus comes directly to his church, who is has received the gift of imputed righteousness and is declared righteous in Jesus, and he's coming to confront his church who has fallen into apostasy and lost their first love and has, you know, all these doctrines of demons and is totally in sexual immorality. And God, the Lord is coming like a judge to call his church back to first love and back to purity and holiness. So just make sure you understand that I'm not saying it's a license for you to live however you want. However, wherever you are, it's the foundation for you to live in victory. Does that make sense? To live in victory, you must live from victory. See, we already looked at this in session nine where God has imparted righteousness to your human spirit and your human spirit is actually righteous when you're born again. Ephesians 4.24, your human spirit is already conformed into the image of Christ. Your human spirit is one with the Holy Spirit. That means one-third of you is on the way towards sanctification already. 
And the, the majority of the work God is doing in your sanctification is to work on your heart, work on your soul, work on your mind, your will, and your emotions, to crucify your flesh and your body from the cravings it wants when it wants it. But one-third of you has already been sanctified. Here's the good news for us is the gift of imputed righteousness covers you legally as God does his work of sanctification in your, in, your, in your heart, in your soul, and in your body. As you are progressing onward in the Lord in that conformity to Jesus Christ, the gift of righteousness covers you legally as God does a dealing work in you. And that is something we must rest in security. That, that his righteousness is our security. His righteousness is the basis for his dealings upon us. Because I believe that one of the greatest ways to begin to live in holiness, if you're struggling in sin, if you're struggling with some kind of sin, some kind of an issue, something is going on in you, one of the greatest ways to begin to live in victory is to live from the reality that God sees me righteous in Christ. That, that you are not living for his approval, you are living from his approval. You are not living to try for God to love you, you are living because he already does love you. You are not trying to gain his favor, but because you already have his favor. To live from that position is a, is a huge, vital shift. To live in victory, you must live from victory. Now, building upon that, in Romans 5.16, again, I just want to say how well, I found this is there's almost like there's two camps in the body of Christ. There's the holiness camp that is like, okay, press on to get ready, press on to get ready, press on to overcome. You know, God is, you must repent and you must get ready and you must get right. I'm 100% I'm in favor of that. But a lot of times this, this readiness camp doesn't have this right foundation. And so what happens is people begin to try to, they, without even realizing, they begin to shift to try to live for God to try to live, to try to be approved by God by what they do and how they get ready and all this. They don't have that right foundation. The other camp has this right foundation, but they don't understand that God is calling us to be made ready. They don't understand that, that we, the bride makes herself ready. And as a result, they think just because you have the gift of imputed righteousness and are, are justified, and they have this down, that, that, the bride, that automatically makes the bride ready because you're in Christ. No, that's not true either. We must have both. We must get ready from righteousness, not for righteousness. We must get ready from this position that then works itself out. If you are getting ready and you have not been getting ready from righteousness, from love, from acceptance, for approval, or from approval, you are most likely getting ready in a way that is a works-based, soulish-based getting ready. And you must get ready from the right foundation or else you will burn out. And else you can't get ready that way anyway. Nothing you do from God in your own strength and power is anything to him. It's all Christ. Christ in the beginning, Christ in the end, Christ all the way through. It's Christ, Christ, Christ. Christ in you, Christ through you. What you do for God is going to be burned up in the judgment seat of Christ. It's Jesus Christ. It's Christ in you. Christ living, not you. It's Christ living through you. So Paul says in Romans 5.16 that the free gift... The, he's talking about the gift of imputed righteousness arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. When Martin Luther received a revelation of, the just, of justification by faith during the Reformation, by the way, Martin Luther, this is interesting, it's probably, my, oh, my wife's not here so she won't hold me from saying this. 
Martin Luther was doing a number two when he got this revelation. So don't tell me God can't speak to you from the throne room because he can. So think about this. God launched a reformation while Martin Luther, or by, while Martin Luther is doing a number two, as they say in Africa, a long call, a number two, God gives him a revelation of justification by faith. And it completely reshaped his own life, reshaped the church, broke away from the Catholic church, uh, reshaped Europe, and actually was the beginning of the birth of America. So pay attention when you're in the throne room what God might be speaking to you. But God, justification by faith is so vital. I'm sure some of you are going to go look that up to see if I was right. Um, uh, it's right, yeah. God really does speak anywhere and anytime. So always be paying attention. Okay. See, when God imputes righteousness to you and he reckons you righteous, he also justifies you. Justification is a declaration not just that you are forgiven, but that you are made righteous even in the matter in which you are accused. So not only does it mean, see, justification is more than just pardon. Justification is more than just saying God forgives you. Justification says you are now made righteous in the matter in which you were accused. Justification means you get a new righteous status. That's incredible. Justification is the opposite of condemnation. The accuser of the brethren accuses you and says you're a hopeless hypocrite. You're never going to amount to anything. The accuser of the brother says, you're never going to be able to please God. You're never going to be able to be who God's called you to be. You are a hopeless hypocrite. You are bound by the flesh. You have so many problems. You have so many issues. You're never going to gain victory and overcome. And God says, no, I am the one who justifies you. Who is the one who condemns you? God says that the love of Jesus Christ cannot, nothing, no principality, no power, no, nothing in heaven or in hell can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. Who is the one who accuses you because God doesn't accuse you? Yes, God corrects you, God disciplines you, God conforms you, God rebukes you, all that, but it's all based from this basis of the righteousness of God and the, and the, the imputed to you and the justification that says you are now declared righteous. You have a new righteous status. I say from this new righteous status, you are righteous in Jesus Christ. That takes all the pressure off of you so that now you can live like, you can play like Cooper Cup where he played free. You can live free, not always worrying about, I said the wrong thing or I did the wrong thing or I went, I, you know, whatever. I did this, you know, I did this and God was saying this and you're always worried about one little mistake. You know, speaking about Martin Luther, Martin Luther had these famous confessionals where before he received a revelation of justification by faith, he would spend up to six hours every single day in a confessional confessing his sins from the slightest thing like, God, I just confess that I had a thought of pride because I was praying for a long time today. Or, God, I confess that I had a bad thought about this brother. And so I'm sure that Martin Luther's prayers drove God crazy. It certainly drove the priest crazy who heard him. But once he got that revelation of justification by faith that now God reckons him righteous, that changed him and Europe and changed the world through the Reformation, through the rediscovery of justification by faith. See, just to make it real simple, justification means you are just as if you had never sinned. And that should be the basis for all sanctification, all getting ready, flows out of that declaration as just as if you had never sinned. So justification also precedes obedience. This is what Paul gets at in Romans chapter 4 through 7. But in, in Genesis 17, 10, God told Abraham, every male among you must be circumcised. And so the question that Paul asked us in Romans, Romans, he says, okay, 
The question we want to answer is, was, was Abraham required to obey this commandment to be right with God or because he was already right with God? Did Abraham receive this commandment because was Abraham obligated to keep this commandment to be justified or because he was already justified? You see what I'm getting at? Justification comes before obe uh, obedience. If you get it the other way around, you are going to actually get into the works of the law. Many people including numerous Christians, are trying to obey their way into favor with God. Many Christians are trying to do all these things so God will bless them, God will favor them, instead of doing it out of the position that God already favors you in Jesus Christ and already declares you are righteous. See, so you ask yourself this question, does your obedience come before your faith or does your obedience come out of your faith? Many, many Christians, sincere, God-loving Christians are trying to obey before faith, trying to do what God wants them to do before faith. And Paul says, no, your obedience must come out of your faith. Your obedience must come out of your justification. Your obedience must come out of the declaration that you are made righteous. Otherwise, you will burn out. Otherwise, and you can even read in Galatians, this is the works of the law. Otherwise, it will sever you from Christ. This is, this is Galatians 3, 10 and Galatians 5, 4. If you are trying to get ready, if you are trying to be made right with God, by obedience to his commandments, apart from being justified in Jesus Christ. These are the works of the law. This is, I mean, this is, you got to hear this. It will sever you from Christ. This is Galatians. It will place you under a curse, and it will nullify grace. This is serious. I mean, this is like, okay, this is good news, but it's seriously good news. You, you've got, if you try... To, to obey, get ready, apart from this place, this foundational place of imputation, of the gift of righteousness, of justification, you actually can be severed from Christ and cut yourself off from his grace. Because the grace of God is received, not achieved. So back to Abraham. Listen to what Paul, listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 4, verse 11. Talking about that very act of, of circumcised Every male. This is what Paul said. And Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised. In other words, it's kind of a little bit confusing to understand. In other words, what Paul's saying is, Abraham's obedience was a sign and a seal of the righteousness God already imputed to him. Abraham obeyed because he was justified not to be justified. Abraham obeyed because he was declared righteous, and from that place of declaring, of being declared righteous, his obedience sprang forth. Just read a couple things here. Obedience before faith is done to gain God's approval. It's done to become righteous. It's done for acceptance. It's done for favor. It's done to avoid condemnation. It's done so God will love you. It's done to prove that you have love for God. I mean, how many of you have ever tried to prove your love for God by doing something for him? And he's like, I didn't never ask you to do that. Why? Why did you even do that? Why did you spend all that time and energy and effort to do all this stuff? I'm not even asking you to do that. Why did you do all that? Obedience that comes from faith. In other words, obedience that comes from this place of faith that I am justified, that I am reckoned righteous, that God sees me righteous in Jesus Christ. That kind of obedience that comes from faith is done because you already have God's approval. Now, if you're living in sin, God is not obviously approving of that, but I'm saying in Christ, you have God's approval. In Christ, you are declared righteous. 
See, when, when you obey from faith, it's because you are declared righteous. You are, you are doing it from a place of acceptance. You are doing it pl- from a place of favor, from a place because God loves you, from a place of there is now no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ. And because you love God, God wants to change our obedience. Now, let me just say this. Incorrect or, I'll say, works-based obedience, works-based obedience is way better than disobedience, okay? Obedience to the law is way better than disobedience to the law. But God wants to change your obedience from a works-based obedience to a love, affection, faith, uh, affection-based obedience. An obedience that comes out of the passion that you have for him. You want to obey him because you are in love with him. Not because you're trying to prove, God, this is how much I love you. But because you love him, you want to please him. See, obe- the, the way you obey the way you obey, this is, getting, this is getting deep. The way you obey is the difference between living under the law and living under grace. You could take the moral commandments in the law and you can look in the New Testament and realize nine of the ten of those commandments, everything except the Sabbath, is in the New Testament. So grace changes how you obey and at the depth of which you obey. See, you could obey the law externally by conforming your outward behavior to the outward commandment. And that's, again, that's better than disobedience. But obeying under grace is God wants to change you from the inside out so that you obey that external commandment from the heart in thought, motive, and deed out of a love for God. Not to prove you love God. How you obey is very important to the Lord. See, ask yourself, do I obey God for approval or from approval? Do I obey God for righteousness or from righteousness? Do I obey God for acceptance or from acceptance? Do I obey God for favor or from favor? Do I obey God for love or from love? Do I obey God to prove my love for God or because I love him? Do I obey to avoid condemnation or to realize that there is now no condemnation in Jesus Christ? Many Christians who have been saved for years are still striving in their own strength and power to try to obey God. When God wants you to obey God from this position of being declared righteous, being declared justified, and from the doing it from the basis of God's indwelling life, Him living rather than you. you I, listen, you cannot in your own strength and power obey God. It's impossible. Have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? It's impossible. You I don't care how good you are, how nice you are, how kind you are, you cannot obey the Sermon on the Mount in your own strength. Maybe for a week, maybe for a day you might be able to do it, but over a lifetime you cannot do it. It's impossible. Only Christ in you can obey it. Now that does not get you off the hook. God still expects you to obey it. But he expects you to die and for Christ in you to live so that you can obey what he calls you to obey. See, many Christians are living to gain God's approval. If I fast, God will bless me. If I pray longer, God will like me more. If I, if I read the Bible more, God will honor me and favor me and, you know, open up doors and, you know, it'll avoid him judging me or whatever. And it's like, no, all those things position you to receive God's grace. They don't earn a thing from God. See, whether you pray or play or fast or feast or watch TV or go to the prayer meeting, none of that can get you into a right standing with God. 
It's by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and you obey out of that place, out of that position from righteousness and not for righteousness. This is the gospel. And this is not elementary. Some people think, oh, that's just elementary. I'm going on to the deeper things of God. Do you realize Paul at the end of his life, after he had done all of these miracles, planted all of these churches, wrote, written, wrote most of the New, New Testament or a lot of the New Testament, suffered for Christ, was persecuted for Christ, was beaten, left shipwrecked, all the different things about Paul. Paul at the very end of his life in Philippians says, I want to, I want to be found, in Philippians 3, 9, I want to be found in him not deriving a righteousness that comes from the law, but a righteousness that comes on the basis of faith. Even Paul, at the end of his life, was still uh, deeply rooted in this, in, this, in this teaching of justification by faith and imputed righteousness. This is not something you never, ever, 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 ever graduate from this. This is not elementary. This is like every day, every day of your life, you are righteous in Christ because, you, because God sees you in Christ and he has imputed his righteousness to you. That is the basis for living in holiness. That's the basis for living in victory. That's the basis of overcoming. That's the basis of getting made ready. In fact, in Revelation 19, 7 and 8, when it talks about the bride has made herself ready, that word, uh, she's been given, uh, the, 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 her wedding dress is the righteous acts of the saints. That word righteous acts actually means what you do with and from your initial justification and declaration of righteousness. It's what you do from this gift of righteousness that will be your wedding dress for all eternity. Getting ready, therefore, comes out of this position of righteousness and justification. Not the other way around. So just in closing, if we want to live by the Spirit of God, we must start from the right foundation of not trying to live for God but live from God. To live from his life in you. To live from this new status, this new position. To live from the declaration that God says, you are righteous. See, where is it that you have been struggling where is it that you have fallen short? A lot of times you can trace it back down and to realize, you know what? I began to believe an accusation. I began to believe a lie. I began to believe the enemy's accusation that I'm not good enough, that I'm, not, that I'm always going to be this hopeless hypocrite. I don't have what it takes to overcome. I don't have what it takes to live this life. And, well, that, that part of that's true. You don't. But you try to think it's all dependent on your own strength and your own power when it's a reality. It's Christ in you who is the overcomer. See, where is it that you have been, where is it that the voice of the accuser has been condemning you when God says, I have justified you and declared you righteous in the matter altogether? And so I just want to bring this to a close and just I want to pray for us, just that the Lord would minister in those areas. Lord, we do come to you. Lord, what an incredible, incredibly good news this is, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, I want you just to, just, just to the, the importance of not just hearing a doctrine of this, but experiencing it. Have you ever, you might know the doctrine of justification by faith, and you might know the doctrine of imputed righteousness, but have you experienced that complete approval from God because you are in Christ? You are in Christ by God's doing. Just 
Rest right now. Just rest. If you're born of the Spirit, if you're born of the Spirit, you are in Christ. By God's doing, you are in Christ. Rest in it. God loves you. God's declared you righteous. God has justified you. God says he favors you, he approves you in Christ. That the past may be washed away. Just that the Lord would minister to some who need to forget the past and just push delete and move on. Just to, you're just bringing up things that, that God has already forgotten about. He forgot about it the first time you confessed your sin to him. It's a theme I believe God is emphasizing is that forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting the past. Forgetting what lies behind. Those things are in the past. God's forgiven those things in the past. That you would begin to live from this, this right and proper foundation. That you would live from victory, not for victory. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, that you would allow, Lord, would you allow right now, by the Spirit of the Lord, for every one of us, Lord, who are hungry to experience this justification by faith, to experience it, not just to know it in their head, to experience. Lord, would you allow us to experience imputed righteousness where we would know that we are righteous in Christ before one act of obedience? Lord, would you allow us to experience this, Lord, by revelation, by the Spirit ministering? Lord, would you minister to those right now in person and online, Lord, that, that need to experience that gift of righteousness, Lord. And so, Father, also for those who are not born again, would you begin to move on their heart Lord, that you must be born again. Holy Spirit, have your way, Lord, we pray. Have your way. Have your way, Lord. We ask for that in the name of Jesus, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Amen. Amen.